Saurav Rajpal is visiting here as uh, Joe Holabek visiting lecturer. He taught uh, yesterday morning and this morning our fellows about the adult congenital heart disease and the use of uh, different uh, imaging modalities in evaluation of cardiac structure and function. Dr. Rajapal graduated uh, from medical school in India, followed by medicine residency at the uh, prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. He then came to this country and did internal medicine residency as well as cardiology fellowship here with us at the LSU Health. I remember an interesting incident at the time uh, when he applied for a cardiology fellowship. One of the medicine attendings came up to me and said, uh, are you taking him uh, into fellowship? Uh, I said, uh, you know, I didn't know, but uh, why are you asking me that question? And uh, the medicine attending said, Dr. Rajpal knows more medicine and more electrocardiography than some of the attending physicians. You ought to take him. And we did take him, and he went on to finish his fellowship with uh, flying colors. He is now a senior fellow uh, in adult congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension at Brigham and Women's and Children's Hospital in Boston uh, with uh, Harvard Medical School. He uh, is a very scholarly individual, has uh, very uh, impressive credentials. We are trying to actually uh, recruit him to faculty here if, uh, if he could work that out. He is going to talk on uh, rapidly rising gradient across the bioprosthetic valves this, uh, this afternoon. As you know, there is nothing more satisfying or gratifying uh, to any of us uh, than a student or a resident or your own fellow comes back to visit and give grand round. So in that sense, I'm very pleased to have Saurabh here to present grand rounds this afternoon. Again, the subject is a rapidly rising gradient across bioprosthetic valves. Saurabh. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, for the generous uh, introduction. And I'm honored and privileged to be here uh, talking uh, in front of all my uh, mentors and who taught me most of the things I know. And uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Today I'm going to talk about uh, rapidly rising gradient across bioprosthetic valves. And I chose this topic because of the increasing number of bioprosthetic valves that are being implanted these days in uh, the community at large. And there is very little known about what happens to them in the future. Uh, there is more research needed in the area. And it, this problem that I'm going to talk about today has the potential to be a major public health issue. So uh, with this introduction, I'll start my talk. Aortic valve replacement data from Society of Thoracic Surgeons National Database has shown that over the past couple of decades, there has been an increase in the use of bioprosthetic valves compared to mechanical valves in the aortic position. Lack of the need for anticoagulation, a greater emphasis on patient preference and the decreased mortality and morbidity that is associated with a cardiac reoperation is probably responsible for this trend. And this trend is so much now that you can see in the year 2006, almost 70 to 80 percent valves that were implanted in the aortic position, this is across all ages, were bioprosthetic valves. Uh, in the mitral position, mechanical valve is still popular. But bioprosthetic valves are increasingly being used. If you consider the traditional textbook teaching about who gets a mechanical valve and who gets a bioprosthetic valve, you would remember that patients older than 65 years of age usually are recommended to get a bioprosthetic valve, a bioprosthetic valve whereas anybody who needs anticoagulation for any reason and uh, 
uh, anybody who uh, is young should get a, a mechanical valve. This trend is not actually followed because like I said before, this teaching is not, traditional teaching is not necessarily followed these days because of, there are various reasons for it. And a patient preference is strongly in favor of bioprosthetic valves. I'll start off with a case. Uh, this is a congenital heart disease patient, a 24-year-old asymptomatic supermarket employee who was born with a unicommissural aortic valve. So you know about bicuspid aortic valves. This is just one cusp, so a unicommissural aortic valve. And a status post multiple valve interventions and surgeries who presented to the ACHD, the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Clinic, uh, for a routine visit. Uh, just to repeat, he is asymptomatic. He was born with a unicommissural aortic valve. He got balloon dilation of the aortic valve in 1991 and 1992. This is in the infancy. You don't want to put a valve at that time. So you try to avoid uh, an artificial valve. Uh, he got aortic valve repair in 2001. He developed severe aortic regurgitation and ascending aortic and aortic root dilatation in 2010. Uh, this is almost when he is 19, 20 years old. Uh, aortic root dilation and aortic dilation is well known phenomena even in unicuspid aortic valves like we know that bicuspid aortic valve patients tend to develop aortopathy. These patients can develop aortopathy also and this he developed that. Uh, for this he got surgery which was an aortic valve replacement with a 25 millimeter mitroflow valve and ascending aortic root replacement. The mitroflow valve is a bovine pericardial tissue valve. He got a post-op echocardiogram and you can see here, this is what we call a parasternal short axis view of the aortic valve. So you look at the valve on FOSS. And you can see that leaflet number one, two, three, all are moving pretty well. We get a gradient across the valve uh, when we do an echocardiogram, which is to check what is the velocity of flow across. And uh, we try to see what the pressure is before and after the valve. Most prosthetic valves that we put in have some gradient that is acceptable. Uh, a gradient of less than 20 is mild gradient, 20 to 40 is moderate gradient which we call moderate aortic stenosis and more than 40 is severe aortic stenosis. Uh, over here we can see that the pressure gradient was 23 millimeters of mercury. This is an acceptable gradient in a patient who's had multiple surgeries. This is just a post-operative echocardiogram. If I was to ask my cardiology colleagues, uh, how frequently should this person get repeat echocardiograms? So people have thought about this and our society, the American College of Cardiology recommends that an annual transthoracic echo is reasonable in patients with a bioprosthetic valve after the first 10 years. So ACC says for the first 10 years, you don't need to repeat an echocardiogram. They give a class one recommendation, which is a recommendation that has good clinical benefit, uh, good uh, randomized control trials to back it up. Repeat transthoracic echocardiogram is recommended in patients with prosthetic heart valves if there is a change in clinical symptoms or signs suggesting valve dysfunction. Now our patient that we talked about was asymptomatic. So a repeat echocardiogram, if you follow these guidelines, are, is not needed. There are caveats though. We got an echocardiogram 10 months later. And uh, what you can see here is that the pressure gradient you see in the previous echo was 23 and here it is 30. Still reasonably acceptable and the gradient that I am giving you, we try to get the highest gradient we can get from different positions. So the gradient that I have on slides is the highest gradient that we got by looking at different positions which could be the right parasternal view or the left parasternal view. But 
look at this valve. You see that all the leaflets are moving reasonably well, but there is some decreased excursion of this leaflet here. And that is why you have a slightly higher gradient, but still valve is moving well, nothing needs to be done at this stage was what was decided. We wanted to repeat an echocardiogram a year later, but the patient had some insurance issues, which is not uncommon in adult congenital heart disease, when patients are on their parents insurance and they ought to go and get a job and if they don't have that, they sometimes they lose insurance and we have to work towards getting them. And so this is what happened. The echo was repeated two years later and what we find now that the gradient has gone up to 35 millimeters of mercury. We try to look at the, a closer look at the valve and you can see that the posterior leaflet over here has decreased excursion. In fact, if you look at it carefully, all three leaflets have decreased excursion. Not only that, you see calcification in the leaflet and at the commissures. This is an unusual form of calcification because you can see that the leaflet is calcified. The valve that was put in was a mitral flow valve which is a bovine prosthetic valve and this is a patient two years out. Well, uh, at that time we wanted another echo six months later, but it happened actually a year later. And what we see now that the excursion of the three left leaflets is even more decreased. The, uh, the area of opening is also less and the gradient has gone up to a maximum gradient of 100 millimeters of 96 millimeters of mercury and a mean gradient of 58 millimeters of mercury which is high. The bottom panel shows the on the y axis is the LV mass and on the x axis is the body surface area. You can see that the patient was over here prior to his surgery in 2013 and his LV mass came down after valve replacement because if you have aortic valve stenosis, the left ventricle hypertrophies. So there is an increase in mass. So what you see on this graph is that this is prior to surgery, the white dot that you see and after surgery, his LV hypertrophy improved. But within three years of valve replacement, his LV mass has gone up again. This is the red dot which is now, it is gone, the LV mass is as much as it was prior to surgery. This is just three years after the valve was put in. People thought about these guidelines when they made them, but you got to look at the fine print. Looking at the fine print of the guidelines, they say earlier evaluation may be prudent in selected patients at increased risk of early bioprosthetic valve degeneration. Now, who are the patients who are at risk of early bioprosthetic valve degeneration? Patients with renal impairment, patients with diabetes, patients with abnormal calcium metabolism, patients with system, uh, systemic inflammatory diseases like lupus or, uh, or systemic sclerosis scleroderma, valves degenerate early in this subgroup of population, we know that. And also patients less than 60 years of age. In fact, if you go by traditional teaching, this patient should have gotten a mechanical valve in the first place. Uh, but he got a bioprosthetic valve based on his and the surgeon's preference at that time. Younger patients come with requests of them being able to participate in competitive sports or even non-competitive sports, uh, recreational sports, and that's why they would ask for a bioprosthetic valve. <coughs> Why were we repeating all this? Why were we repeating echoes so frequently? It is because we knew this. There was a death of a child at Boston Children's Hospital due to accelerated bioprosthetic aortic stenosis. This was a 12 year old girl who had presented with diarrhea and died suddenly while in the hospital. Autopsy showed that her bioprosthetic valve, which was the mitral flow valve, the pediatric age group patients also get bioprosthetic valves because it is very hard to manage anticoagulation in children. Uh, 
that was the reason the 12 year old girl had gotten that valve. She was just two years out of her surgery and autopsy showed that she had severe bioprosthetic aortic stenosis. Her valve was severely calcified and had stenosed just two years. We looked at 27 patients with aortic valve replacement with bovine pericardial valves less than 30 years of age with a median follow of of 13.7 years. So about 80 to 90 patients got aortic valve replacement uh, in that time and uh, there were 27 patients who got uh, valve replacement with a bovine pericardial prosthesis. Some patients of these got aortic valve repair, some people got conduits, but these are the patient who got, uh, 27 patients got bioprosthetic valves. But, uh, and there were two main types. Sorry. There were two main varieties of uh, bovine valves that they got. One was the MitroFlow LXA type of valve. There were 15 patients with this valve. And the other group of patients were who got the Magna or the Magna Ease valves, which are the, Carpent the Carpentier Edwards uh, model. By the end of three years, only 18% of MitroFlow valves were still working. So, all these patients uh, needed aortic valve replacement again, who got the mitral flow valves, which is the valve that our patient got. 100% of the patients, which was an N of 12, were, of the Magna Ease valves were doing fine. This is a graph that shows the maximum instantaneous gradient on the y axis and the time from aortic valve replacement in, on the x-axis. So you see the, what happens to the maximum instantaneous gradient across the valve, which is a measure of aortic stenosis over time. In the red lines, you see the mitral flow valves, the valve that our patient got. And in the black, you see the Magna Ease valves, which is the other type of bioprosthetic valve that was implanted during the same time. You can see that how rapidly the valve gradient goes up. And this you can see by the, how steeply the red lines go up. So not only you see a rise in gradient, you see a dramatic and ex or explosive rise in gradient. So the gradient would be normal at one year, whereas six months later, after valve replacement, the gradient suddenly goes up. This was being noticed in the, uh, in the mitral flow bioprosthesis. Our institution wasn't the only one that was showing this. This is uh, data from Seneg in uh, France, University of Nantes, and they showed something similar. Their, a, their patients were older. So their patients were, the, the, the mean age was 76 years in these patients, and they had a median follow-up of uh, three to four years of 617 patients. Of these 617, about 39 patients developed uh, structural valve degeneration. For the uh, five year survival with, with structural valve disease free survival was about 90% for the whole cohort. So by five years, almost 10% of the valves had failed. This is a number higher than expected for a bioprosthetic valve. Not only were these valves failing, these valves were failing at an accelerated rate. So you may have a normal gradient six months prior, and now you have a very high gradient across the valve. Uh, 13 of these patients, which is one, uh, one third, had an accelerated structural valve degeneration, whence the mean gradient exceeded 30. This is also the number that we noted at our patients, that once the gradient got over 30 millimeters of mercury, the degeneration was rapid. In, in their subgroup, the structural valve degeneration was the strongest correlate of overall mortality. A center from Spain also showed this. Uh, they had 491 patients with a median follow-up of 
again 3 to 4 years and 4% uh, had to undergo repeat aortic valve regurgitation. Structural valve disease, uh, structural valve degeneration was identified in 27 patients. You would think that when a bioprosthetic valve is approved in market, these tests have taken place and there have, or some populations have been studies, have been studied. Well, the population were studied, but the, all the studies that were done prior to this, prior to the Boston Children's Hospital study and the study from France, what they used as an endpoint was aortic valve replacement or re-replacement of the aortic valve. If you use that as an endpoint, you have to, you have to know that most people who get bioprosthetic valves are older and they may not be candidates for repeat surgery. So if you study a parameter in your study that you're going to look at people who get repeat aortic valve replacements, you may miss out on those older and elderly patient who, patients who needed valve replacement but did not get it because they were not candidates for it as they were older. After the, these three studies, the one from Boston Children's, Spain and uh, here, people started looking at echo parameters for structural valve degeneration. And more number of patients who were previously missed in previous studies were identified who had structural valve degeneration based on echo but were not candidates of aortic valve replacement. What happens to this, this is valve? The fresh explanted mitral flow valve from case number 12. So this is Dr. Sanders who's uh, one of the pathologists at the cardiac registry looking at one of the explanted prosthetic valves and going through the changes that he sees in those. This is the fresh explanted mitral flow valve from case number 12. Note that the belly of the leaflet is completely fixed and immobile while a two or three millimeter strip at the free edge remains pliable. From the ventricular surface, we see that the leaflets are quite stiff and immobile. Even considerable force barely moves the leaflets. So the valve leaflets are calcified. Looking at microscopic pathology, you can see that there is a calcification in panel A in, for the entire thickness of the valve leaflet. Here you can see calcification, this is from a second patient extending into the belly of the leaflet, valve leaflet. And this in panel C you can see Mason's trichrome stain showing the presence of fibrin in a non-calcified leaflet probably suggesting that fibrin happens first followed by calcification of the valve leaflet which eventually involves the entire thickness of the leaflet. This is a 3D reconstruction of a high resolution CT scan of the explanted mitral flow valve from case 11. Calcium density is shown in purple and leaflet tissue in semi-transparent yellow. Note the marked calcification of the belly of this leaflet with extension up to the commissure on the left side. Cutting into the leaflet shows that the calcification is intrinsic to the valve leaflets or within the core of the leaflets. Cutting down toward the base of the leaflets shows that the bellies are densely and uniformly calcified. Coming back toward the free edge of the leaflets shows that the calcification is much more patchy and the leaflet thickness more variable. There are areas of leaflet without calcification shown in yellow. So 
So why does this happen? Why do the leaflets calcify early? Did we already know this? Fleming from Belgium looked at 648 patients with an average age, mean age of 74 years who were followed for seven and a half years and found that structural valve degeneration was found in 12.6 percent of the patients who got bioprosthetic valves. Fleming was looking at the reasons why bioprosthetic valves would fail and he looked at different bioprosthetic valves. So he looked at the mitral flow valve, he looked at the Carpentier Edward valves and he looked at the porcine valves that were available in the market and he tried to find out which factors are responsible for early valve degeneration. His group found that anti-mineralization treatment and patient prosthesis mismatch are major determinants of the onset and incidence of structural valve degeneration in bioprosthetic valves. We knew this from older data that if the valves do not undergo anti-mineralization treatment, they may fail early or they can develop early degeneration. But the mitral flow valve did not undergo anti-mineralization treatment. The other valve that we were implanting, the magna and the magnaise valves did undergo anti-mineralization treatment. This was identified or re-identified uh, in 2013 and in, by 2014 there were reports coming from all different hospitals about how the mitral flow valve was failing. Uh, this is from the same study that show and they showed that there is an additive effect of lack of anti-mineralization treatment and pros, uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. So if you have a smaller valve that has not undergone anti-mineralization treatment, it's going to fail early. The mitral flow valve was advertised as a valve that is less bulky. The surgeons loved it because it was easier to implant in uh, a smaller area. So most patients who got mitral flow valves, which, was, which had not undergone anti-mineralization treatment, were people with smaller annuli, so 19, 21, 23 size. Those were the most of the mitral flow valves were implanted in those annuli. Without an with, without anti-mineralization treatment, and that has an additive effect of early valve failure. So let me summarize what we have talked about: early structural valve degeneration of uh, bioprosthetic valves. Early structural valve degeneration of stenosis type is frequent in mitral flow valves. Uh, there is also another type identified which is a regurgitant type when you have more aortic valve regurgitation but those are less frequent. So the stenosis type is more common in this valve. Early structural valve degeneration has been shown to occur across all age groups but more so in children and young adults and I say that because at the end of three years only 18 percent of our patients uh, who got those valves, which was an N of 15, uh, were free of structural valve degeneration. And if I was to tell you from now, there's only one patient that remains with that valve. Everybody else who got that valve has either died or needed another valve. An unpredictable and accelerated pattern of structural valve degeneration can be seen and could be a life-threatening condition, like we saw in two of our patients who died unexpectedly. Uh, they usually presented with either minor infection that otherwise wouldn't have led to death, but because they were not able to increase their cardiac output because of the stenosed bioprosthetic valve is what led to the death, is our theory. Uh, structural valve degeneration is the strongest correlate of overall mortality in, these, in this group. Uh, macroscopic findings, we already, I showed you two slides on that about calcification of the leaflets. As a result of the large number of mitral flow valves implanted worldwide, so there's an estimate, if you look at the mitral flow website, 200,000 of these valves have been implanted across the world. Uh, this could be a major public health issue. 
close follow-up with yearly or six-monthly echocardiography after mitral flow implantation is advisable. This is not in the guidelines, but I hope when the next valve guidelines come out, this will be addressed. Uh, even otherwise, bioprosthetic valves, any bioprosthetic valve, not only mitral flow, magna is carpentier, and even the porcine valves, once you see that the mean gradient is going above 25, 30 millimeters of mercury, you can't do 10 yearly echoes on that. They need more frequent monitoring because the way the bioprosthetic valves fail, as, and there's more research going into this, is that they, they will fail suddenly. So you need to have very close follow-up of these valves. An urgent reoperation should be considered in patients with severe structural valve degeneration even though they are still asymptomatic. So like in our patient, he was asymptomatic, but he had a peak gradient of 100 millimeters across his aortic valve with LV hypertrophy. He meets all criteria for urgent surgery. Shifting gears a little bit and talking about another case, uh, this is one of uh, the patients I saw in, uh, in the hospital. The 24-year-old musician, uh, he was waiting for a music contract, which he got at the end of his hospitalization, uh, he had a past history of bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, he was born with a bicuspid valve and needed a ROS procedure for infective endocarditis <coughs> at age five years. So what they do in ROS procedure is they move the pulmonary valve to the aortic position and then put a RV to PA conduit. Uh, in, on the right side of the heart. So this is the ROS procedure. Uh, it is very popular in, uh, especially in Canada, where most of these surgeries are done, and also some hospitals in New York. Uh, there are proponents of whether ROS is a good surgery or whether you should be doing aortic valve, simple aortic valve replacement or repair in these patients. But that's not a topic for our discussion. Uh, because there is a conduit from right ventricle to a PA, this was when he was five years of age when he got this, uh, the baby grows, the child is going to grow, and he's going to need replacement of the RV to PA conduit. So he got RV to PA conduit revision in 2004. The RV to PA conduit is something that needs frequent interventions because it develops neurointemal changes that RV2PA conduit stenosis is not uncommon. And he developed that in 2010 for which he needed a melody valve implantation. Melody valve is a bovine internal jugular vein. So it is the internal jugular vein of the cow. And uh, you make a valve out of that. It's, the, it's, it's actually the jugular valve of the cow. And you can put it in the RV2PA conduit position. Uh, by means of a catheter, so you don't need to do repeat surgery. It is especially ideal for RV to PA conduit patients because they've already undergone a lot of sternotomies, and if he can avoid a sternotomy, it's a durable valve, and it acts really well. The problem with melody valve has been repeated incidents of, or a higher incidence of infective endocarditis. He presented to the outside hospital with fever of 104 and syncope. Blood cultures within six hours were going uh, MSSA. He had come to uh, the clinic for a routine visit four months before his presentation. And uh, for people who read echoes and those who don't, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. And when you see a nice round ventricle, you're happy. You don't like to see a flat ventricle. Flat ventricle is not good. It means the right ventricular systolic pressure is high. There may be pulmonary hypertension. These could be the two things. Uh, this is our patient's echo when he came to us. It's flat. And you can use this profile, this Doppler profile, to assess what the pressure is. The pressure that the right ventricle is facing. And you can see that the pressure gradient is about 50 millimeters of mercury, which is very high for the RV in the acute setting. And that is why the patient had syncope.
This is a study from uh, Boston Children's Hospital where we looked at 147 patients who got melody valves and were followed for 19 months. 10 patients developed possible endocarditis and 4 patients had definite prosthetic endocarditis. This study also found that an increased right ventricular outflow tract gradient, which is a rapid gradient, uh, a rising gradient, was noted in all patients who developed endocarditis. Other factors associated with endocarditis in patients who got the melody valve were male sex, previous history of endocarditis, stents in the right ventricular outflow tract, and presence of outflow tract irregularities at the implant site. Uh, you don't want to forget one thing that can also lead to a rapidly rising gradient across bioprosthetic valves. So we talked about structural valve degeneration, we talked about infective endocarditis leading to a high gradient across a bioprosthetic valve. The third thing which was underappreciated and is being increasingly appreciated now is bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. Traditionally, it has been thought that bioprosthetic valve thrombosis happens in the perioperative period. Uh, this study from Mayo Clinic, they looked at autopsy data from 397 patients with explanted bioprosthesis from 1997 to 2013, and they identified 46 cases of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. Mean age of the patients was 63 years and more than half of them were male. Uh, they found that 65 percent of the cases occurred after 12 months. So when you talk about bioprosthetic valves, you are not only talking about the perioperative period now. Bioprosthetic valve thrombosis can occur outside of the perioperative period. In fact, 65 percent of their cases were outside of one year of age. This is significant because we usually do not anticoagulate patients with bioprosthetic valves unless they have a second indication or a third indication like a low EF or atrial fibrillation. But they identified six uh, many cases of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. And again they found that one of the best ways to initially detect and screen is a higher gradient when you notice suddenly a higher gradient across a bioprosthetic valve, which again calls for more frequent echocardiograms in these patients. In fact, if you look at uh, more uh, uh, recent articles from the same group at Mayo, they suggest that you just have to look for an excuse to anticoagulate these patients. So if somebody has a bioprosthetic valve and they have any other excuse to anticoagulate, you should anticoagulate them. This is just showing, the slide shows that the study at Mayo, they looked at different valves, aortic valve, mitral, tricuspid and pulmonary and uh, they, were, they identified structural failure or bioprosthetic valve thrombosis based on what they looked at, uh, how the valve looked at. This was assessed by three pathologists. So what happened to our cases? The first patient, even after this, again refused a mechanical valve and got a new type of reconstruction which is Ozaki type aortic valve re reconstruction. What they do in this one is it is a photofix pericardium which has undergone uh, anti mineralization treatment and it is shown directly in the valve position. Uh, the second patient who was a musician who got the contract after his hospitalization, he underwent he, he was in shock when we got him. So we had to treat him immediately. The decision was between taking him to the OR immediately or doing something to temporize him and stabilize him before taking him to the OR as he was in a state of shock. So he, he got taken to the cath lab where the melody valve was dilated uh, by a balloon uh, which relieved the shock like situation that he was in because the shock was from lack of cardiac output from the right side. Once that was taken care of, we treated him with antibiotics for two and a half weeks after which he got replacement of his right ventricle to PA conduit with a pulmonary homograft. 
Uh, both these uh, patients are doing quite well, and I saw them in clinic. Uh, revising what we just talked about, rapidly rising gradient across bioprosthetic valves can be from structural valve degeneration, infective endocarditis, or bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. Bioprosthetic valves can degenerate early, especially in younger patients. Keep an eye out for them. Early structural valve degeneration of the valve stenosis type is frequent in mitral flow bioprosthesis and could be life threatening. So, if you have a patient with bioprosthetic valves, we suggest you find out what type of valve they have and if they had the mitral flow LXA or LX15. Now, mitral flow. Uh, the company's name is Soren. They came out with the next generation of mitral flow valve, which has undergone anti mineralization treatment. After the report from Children's and France, uh, ACC had a warning on their site for the next one and a half years, which warned doctors from uh, surgeons from implanting these valves. These valves were not taken away from the market, they are still in the market because the studies were small, and some people would say this happened only in small sized valves but it is for everyone to see. Infective endocarditis can lead to bioprosthetic valve stenosis and a high gradient on Doppler echocardiography. Bioprosthetic valve thrombosis is not uncommon and can occur several years after surgery. Thank you. When you see a, a high gradient across the bioprosthetic valves, it is important to see why you have that. So, you look for whether this is from uh, structural valve degeneration or whether this is thrombosis. The Mayo Clinic paper that I talked about gives you five criteria to look at to figure out if this is thrombosis. If it is thrombosis, anticoagulation worked in most of the cases that they had. But if it is structural valve degeneration that you see, then depending on how high the gradient is and how the left ventricle is responding to that gradient, you can decide on either doing a close follow up within 3 to 6 months or replacing the aortic valve. The line of gradient is greater than 50% of the previous echo. Yes, greater than 50% of the previous echo or if the rise in gradient is a mean gradient over 30, you always uh, we recommend doing echo every 6 months on these patients. Is there a valve that you think is better than others in the bioprosthetic right now in market? Uh, the, the Carpentier Edward valves and the Magnaise valves are the ones that are implanted. They, these are all bovine pericardial valves. Uh, people who study this at Children's Hospital tell me that in children, even those valves are failing a little bit earlier than they would expect. And it becomes especially a problem in young adults and children. There is no good valve for them. And more research needs to be done where we could come up with something that is in between a mechanical and an aortic valve. Uh, personal preference and institutional preference, onyx valves are good because they are kind of in between and new studies are being done where we can get away with lower levels of anticoagulation than before. There is no conclusive data yet, but uh, hopefully we can keep a lower level of anticoagulation like 1.5 to 2 and still manage the onyx valve. So, these two are the most frequently that I see at Boston being implanted, the Carpentier Edwards and the Onyx valves. Yeah. Okay, if there are no questions.